Hi, and good afternoon, everybody. It's Terry Justin at HR Strategies. Thank you for joining today as uh, we cover the topic of preparing for more effective compensation planning. Uh, hoping that today what we'll be able to do is, uh, as always, um, you know, enlighten you to some things that are happening out on the marketplace that are occurring that will make compensation planning more useful and easy for you. We're going to address compensation planning at a high level. We're going to be able to help you, those of you that haven't done compensation planning at all from the get-go, um, really understand what's required. And hopefully at the same time, for those of you that are a little bit of experts, uh, provide some clarification, detail, or even just back your thoughts around what's happening in compensation planning out on the marketplace. I'm really happy today to not be presenting alone. Uh, for those of you that have been following our monthly series, it is Terry Justin. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a senior VP of uh, global sales here at HR Strategies. I have an in-depth HR background and spanning about 23 years where I've um, held roles uh, at HR.com, uh, understanding and interviewing their senior uh, leadership in HR organizations, identifying the problems they have and how they overcame them in a series called Reality HR. I also uh, in-depthly interviewed all of the vendors and technology out on the marketplace. Um, so I really understand technology and what's happening. I've also owned my own IT recruiting firm. So together in many areas, I've been able to uh, understand the value both of what HR is trying to accomplish in the organization and how technology can enable that. Today, I'm pleased to have with me Denise Bislin. She uh, comes to us with over 15 years in compensation consulting, but an even more vast experience in overall HR including in titles as high as uh, VP of HR. She's got great uh, background in compensation and OD, and uh, she's here today to share uh, a lot of what she's done in consulting with other organizations around building out compensation practices. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. Okay, so compensation, uh, we're going to today look at it from a strategic perspective perspective and then take that right down to a more tactical or pragmatic perspective. It's important uh, when we are looking at the key components of a compensation strategy to understand our organization's pay philosophy, to develop and craft a pay strategy that supports that, uh, understanding what you want to reward and what will keep your organization competitive in the, the market for talent. We want to look at pay structures, how to define, define and develop them so that you have guidelines for your organization that are uh, reflective of market and do address internal equity. We want to talk a little bit more about uh, the administrative component of uh, pay and how to build in processes like annual reviews, promotions, job changes, adjustments, and so forth. And finally, we want to talk about communicating pay. I think this is maybe the most important uh, component to get right. If you uh, set your leaders up to be able to communicate key messages effectively and uh, connect with your employees on the value of the rewards, uh, I think that is uh, a very important aspect of making sure that your compensation strategies are successful. So just briefly, most organizations are talking now about their total reward structure or strategy, and what are the rewards for working in this organization? What are the rewards for my work? So certainly pay is a big part of that, both base pay and variable pay, bonuses and what have you, but there are other components that affect the attract ability to attract and retain. Uh, benefits programs that uh, reassure employees around health and welfare and the perquisites that may be part of the organization's reward structure. Opportunities for advancement that might include professional development or promotional opportunities within an organization that may attract or retain individuals. And finally, your culture. What is the purpose of your organization? Uh, is my job valued and appreciated? And what kind of work environment? So all of those components are very, very important. Today, we will focus on the uh, pay component and making sure that 
that uh, aspect of the total reward structure is uh, meeting the organization's needs. There are a lot of stakeholders when it comes to compensation, and I think that's why it gets a lot of attention uh, organizationally. It's something that, of course, is near and dear to every employee's heart, and they have a strong vested interest in a, a pay strategy that supports their needs. But we also have others looking at our compensation strategy. The executive team and the board of directors, they want to understand, is that compensation strategy, meeting our needs, giving us a return on our payroll dollars investment, and driving the levels of productivity and uh, success that we're looking for. Uh, management are certainly interested in it from a practical standpoint to make sure they have the tools and resources they need to get work done and optimize retention. The HR group, of course, are, are focused on whether the pay practices are helping meet the HR strategic goals of attracting and retaining talent. Finance will want to understand the impact of payroll dollars and particularly the importance of compensation in being able to budget effectively. And if you have a unionized environment, of course, they're interested in making sure that the compensation is competitive and consistent with whatever has been uh, bargained for in the collective agreement. So many stakeholders to consider as you develop this project. Um, your organization's pay philosophy is uh, a great place to start in thinking about those stakeholders and their various interests. And we want to know a little bit more about what our organization's competitive strategy is, what uh, the competition for talent is like, what type of work culture are you trying to build in your um, organization, what behaviors are important to reward? What talent is important to retain? Who do you want to attract? And what are some of the pain points the organization might be experiencing? You'll want to think about whether you want to buy top talent, uh, whether you want to grow talent. So there's a lot of uh, variables in that pay philosophy. So we move on in terms of the organization strategy and drill down to, okay, now that we understand a little bit about our organization, what jobs are strategic, what's um, the focus in terms of long-term retention versus bringing in new talent, once we understand that, we can start to design a compensation strategy to support it. So we're looking at how uh, how your org organization's pay program will drive those targeted business results, where you want to position yourself in the market. Do you want to be a um, uh, top payer? Do you want to be a uh, lead or lag in the market? So some organizations will try to get ahead of the curve and pay uh, in anticipation of adjusted pay rates in the marketplace. Others will wait to see if the market moves and uh, adjust their pay accordingly. We'll want to understand the allocation of revenue that's allocated to people resources. This is a, a high margin business where the knowledge capital is key or is it a production environment where uh, being a low cost producer is a strategic advantage. Uh, we want to look at what the weighting of pay is relative to other reward strategies. What about that benefits plan? And if it's a rich plan, then how do we marry that with the base uh, compensation structure to make sure that we are where we want to be relative to market? What is the mix of base and variable? And uh, most importantly, what message do you want your pay program and your pay practices? to send to your employees. A lot of organizations don't appreciate that when they are delivering compensation, they're sending a, a hidden message about what the organization values and what's important. So it's really important to be able to, to communicate to employees in a way that they're getting the message that you intended to send. You know, Denise, yesterday when we were preparing for uh, today's meeting, we talked about why this is becoming so important out on the market, and you cited specifically some examples that have brought to light the pain around uh, pay equity and that. Do we want to talk about that now or when we get to the equity section? 
Yeah, we'll certainly get into that in a little bit more detail, but there, uh, in terms of pain point, there is definitely a global, uh, and I'm saying global because I've seen a number of uh, US and European countries starting to uh, follow suit in terms of building in pay equity as a requirement to close inadvertent pay gaps that have historically existed between different uh, employee uh, demographics. So we are seeing as part of the strategy a need to make sure we incorporate uh, that into our, our compensation approach. We also, and this has uh, certainly been very common in the past, is considerations when gathering market data. So in addition to being internally equitable, as would be driven by the, some of those pay equity principles, we also want to make sure we're positioned appropriately relative to market. So some considerations we're going to think about when we're going out to gather market data from organizations that either charge you a fee or offer you complimentary information is, is this data truly reflective of the market I'm competing with? So in some cases, you'll get market survey data that specializes in, um, I'll just say professional roles and maybe doesn't meet the needs of a production environment. Uh, in some cases, the salary survey might be across Canada, but your focus might be a particular province or state in the United States. So it's making sure that your location is appropriate, that the size of the organization is reflective. Some salary programs tend to reflect top tier employers that have the ability to, we'll just say dedicate more compensation or more, more revenue to gathering that compensation data. So you wanna make sure that you're getting the right salary survey to match your needs. You want to understand when they gather that data. Um, some of the organizations that market salary and compensation information are anywhere up to uh, a year behind where the market actually is today. So it's important to understand what their cutoff point was and to look at where you are and whether that uh, supports your um, compensation strategy. You also have to look at the data and how reliable it is. Um, it's certainly important from a reliability point of view to make sure that uh, the source of the data is accurate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that around the different types of suppliers of data. You might have a large uh, compensation consulting firm that's global that is gathering data from compensation specialists around the globe, it presumably would be relatively reliable. We certainly count on the people reporting that data to, to report it reliably. But what we do see is sometimes a mismatch between a job title and a um, actual job description that ends up in mismatches. So we want to make sure that the quality of the survey data is very reliable and we also want to make sure that where they're gathering their data from the sources can be identified. Some of the newer compensation consulting groups like Payscale or uh, Salary.com, they're gathering multitudes of data, some of it self-reported, and that can skew the data that you are receiving. And then there are custom surveys where you know you need to match a very specific job, so you take that job and go out to specific uh, companies that have similar roles, and people agree to participate in a confidential survey of that sort. So there's a lot of different ways to gather data, but uh, data reliability is important, and I think that goes particularly to the last point on this page. Will my stakeholders accept the sources of reference as valid? So if the employees don't agree with the sources of data that have been gathered, uh, it uh, sometimes um, affects their willingness to accept the salary data that's been, uh, been sourced. You also need to, when you're looking at your data, make sure your sample sizes are reasonable, that uh, you know, you're not just matching one, um, for example, one um, 
project manager job with another project manager job. That's far too broad. You've got to make sure you have the right company matching it and the uh, appropriate number of incumbents so that you're comparing maybe your project manager job to a thousand in the market, not five or ten. Uh, that may be misrepresentative. You'll look at the who are the participants in that survey. Uh, are they companies that you want to compare with? We know that the big global firms tend to have participants that are big global companies. We know that local survey organizations tend to so survey in a smaller geographic area. So really looking at who the participants are, are they from my sector, do they have jobs that are similar to the jobs that I have. We we'll also want to make sure they compare the same apples to apples. Are they comparing total compensation or just base salaries? And do you need to be looking at that total compensation package? It's, um, it's important to look at uh, whether that data is based on incumbents in the role, people that are already sitting in the job, or is this about just uh, recent placements? So a lot of uh, recruitment firms will publish salary data, but it tends to be skewed toward the placements that they've just made or the salary ranges they've been quoted, which aren't necessarily the mature um, side of the market. So, so good to look at your data sources and really make sure you're gathering the right data. You'll also want to think about market positioning and where you want to position your organization relative to the market. You can be anything from a 90th percentile top pair, uh, recognized in industry as the, uh, the place to go for great compensation. Uh, they have high retention as a rule and uh, have no difficulty attracting employees, but in some cases you're going to risk stagnation. You're going to risk people that stay because of the pay as opposed to job challenge and, and interest. So uh, there aren't too many organizations that uh, that work at that 90th percentile, but if yours is one of them, it should be for a deliberate reason, and it should be part of your strategy, particularly related to key roles in the organization. Uh, for example, if you were a software company that needed a um, specific uh, strategic skill or talent, you might uh, pay at the 90th for a role of that nature. Uh, 75th is, uh, again, easier to attract uh, candidates from the competition for key roles. Uh, it offers stability in your role. People aren't likely to turn over as quickly, but you should also consider the fact that you may be overpaying in some roles. 60th percentile, just above market, good in a competitive market, again, helps keep a lid on the turnover. Um, so that's uh, certainly a strategy that some organizations deploy. Very typical to see organizations at the 50th percentile, or as we refer to it, at market. In a less competitive market, it keeps your people costs in check and, and uh, gives you the ability to attract with other aspects of your total reward strategy. Going slightly below market is a strategy for organizations where perhaps uh, the talent is not strategic or they're um, concerned that uh, uh, they have the ability to attract, um, so they want to stay, stay as close to market as possible. And then at the lowest level, say your strategy was to position yourself at the 25th percentile, that's the lower end of the market, but many organizations take a strategy uh, around growing their own talent and building competencies. McDonald's might be an, an example of that where they have been quite well known for maybe not being the best payer in the market, but looking at ways to uh, position themselves to grow and develop people. Would you really think that uh, positioning yourself in the 25th, um, 5th percentile is actually strategy or is it somewhere where you find yourself and then you build your strategy? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the organization. Some that need to be a low cost producer to compete in foreign markets or what have you might go in with that deliberate strategy, but they would certainly have to pay a lot of attention to the total reward strategy. They would definitely need to make sure that some of the other aspects, perhaps work environment uh, or development opportunities exist. Perfect. Okay, so we've talked a lot about sort of the, the strategic elements, making sure you understand your organization, making sure that you 
uh, have developed a compensation strategy that supports those organizational goals. Now we're going to get a little bit more tactical and talk about, all right, so now I need to build a pay structure for my organization, or if you already have a pay structure, it may be that you want to validate or test the existing pay structure. The most essential element here, and I've experienced it too many times to be contrary, is that you have good quality job information and good employee data. This has been a huge challenge for many, many organizations, and somehow it seems that the larger you get, the tougher it is to maintain that quality uh, data for analysis purposes. But it is sort of the first step of, uh, of the process, so it is making sure that to the extent you can, you've got great job descriptions and you've got great employee data that's current with appropriate job titles attached to the appropriate people and the uh, current pay rate. Once you've done that, you've got an opportunity to understand the uh, job hierarchy that exists within your organization. We'll call that groups of jobs or families of jobs. You want to be able to understand uh, that hierarchy relative to your structure of pay bands. And that goes to the innate assumption, presumption that uh, leadership roles will be compensated in a way that recognizes their knowledge, experience, and ability to manage, and non-leadership roles will be a path to those types of roles. Um, it may also be a technical specialist role where uh, you want to understand that you're protecting top talent in a career path that is more technologically driven. So you want to get a fix on your org charts, your job hierarchy, and then uh, assess those jobs to determine which jobs are similar to other jobs in the group. So on the um, basis of skill, effort, responsibilities, and work environment, what jobs are most like other jobs. You might have an administrative level, you might have a management level, you might have a professional level. So you're looking at trying to group jobs that are similar. Your, uh, to our discussion earlier, you're going to want to use good market data to benchmark similar jobs to the ones you're comparing internally with the market. And then you're going to uh, do what is not, although some people may think it's precise science, what is really determining a best fit uh, considering your compensation strategy and your organizational philosophy. That should get you to the point where you've got a pay structure starting to form. When you're looking at that pay structure, you want to consider internal pay equity as well as external pay equity. So for many decades, uh, companies would simply have a pay philosophy, which was, for example, pay market. And pay market is fine if your structure is already tested and sound and internally equitable. But if the market is not equitable and you mirror the market, you are likely to get yourself into uh, a little bit of difficulty, both between internal job satisfaction issues and because of uh, pay equity and compliance requirements in uh, organizations, states, countries that have, uh, have compliance issues. So uh, building internal pay equity means analyzing the data internally to capture that job hierarchy that typically already exists and identifying your compensable factors. You want to look, when you're identifying those compensable factors, at that for which the organization pays. Uh, that might be things like the level of decision making or problem solving or creativity required. It might be the education needed and it might be the work experience needed. Once you've uh, decided for what you will pay or what those compensable factors are, uh, you can group jobs on that basis. Once you group those jobs, you can look at the um, uh, hierarchy and compare it by regression analysis with your actual pay statistics to be able to identify any gaps or potential inequities that may be based on gender or other prohibited grounds. And we'll also uh, recognize alignment with your band structure. 
The job evaluation may be a point factor system as you identify those compensable factors, or it could be a different job evaluation methodology that just really factors in the relative internal worth of jobs. Once you've done all that, you can compare existing practices with market, and following that, um, you know, understanding that people need to, within the organization, feel that their job worth is recognized and valued relative to other jobs. So we want to be sure that we are putting in place a defensible system so that when somebody says, I, I feel like my job should be valued more highly, I, you have a methodology that you're going to be able to speak to about why certain jobs get paid more or less than other jobs. So we did have a question, Denise, that came up here. It's asking us, have you seen a shift in going from your typical pay structure that groups like jobs to individual job pricing? Uh, yeah, I would say um, that that is not what I've seen as the trend. I have seen job groupings because individual job pricing may not be viewed as compliant. Uh, if there are compliance issues, which are certainly increasing, and also because individual job pricing tends to reflect market, and that pay for market is um, does not necessarily drive your internal equity. So jobs relative to one another. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, we hope that answers your question. If not, we're certainly um, going to give you contact details at the end and be happy to engage and, and address anything that you'll have independently after that. Another question we did have, of course, which we always have and I usually address at the beginning is uh, access to this slide. And yes, uh, everybody that uh, is here today will get access to um, the slide presentation as well. So I think, you know, we've we've covered pay equity and we can't stress enough how important this is we you can uh, look at any newspaper almost any day um, even pay equity is brought up in recent award ceremonies uh, with some of the actor guilds and that out there where they're feeling you know as we discussed yesterday in preparing for here that the female actors are still underpaid over the male actors um, it's an issue that's top of mind for companies and employees alike, and it cannot be, um, you know, taken for granted. We really need to do what we can do to um, stop these inequalities, or we do set ourselves up for the propensity to be sued. Absolutely. I was just uh, speaking to an organization yesterday, and uh, the female soccer players have launched a class action suit uh, around pay inequities between the equivalent male soccer players and female soccer players. And I think the interesting thing to look at is, yes, they um, are acknowledging that maybe the revenue draw is not the same, but the pay gap is actually greater than the revenue gap. So if there's you know, only a 20% difference in the amount of money the, the female players bring in relative to the male players, there's a 40% pay gap between uh, the respective groups. So when you're thinking about fairness or equity, there is a period right now where past inequities need to be addressed. And I think even if there wasn't any legislation, it's still important for organizations to do the right thing for their employees and make sure that the reason you're getting paid what you're getting paid is because of the job worth and what you're doing and not because of a uh, an individual or personal attribute. Right, and that also leads to the overall culture of organizations. I mean, you can't have a good culture and have everybody feel uh, like the company is ethical and, and, you know, integral if they're displaying practices of inequality, I would Precisely. say. Precisely, yeah, and of course that goes to your entire HR strategy around diversity. So is it okay to say we are an inclusive and diverse organization and then have your pay practices not support that? So again, that alignment across HR programs and strategies is really important. It's like, to, it's what I call walk the talk, is I find so many organizations, you know, if you go to any career sites out there on the marketplace and you look at uh, considering a job there and they all talk about uh, their equal opportunity employers, you know, their best place to work for, their people are their most important assets. 
but uh, that's all talk unless they're actually following up on delivering it inside the organization. And that's where I think us in HR have to hold our organizations accountable to be doing that. So important. And, uh, and because we're asking the organization to part with revenue or part with margin to do those right things, uh, it takes uh, a really strong business case to make sure the organization understands the implications of not doing. And I would assume a partnership as well between the CFO from a finance perspective and CEO to buy into this in order to make these programs work. Absolutely. And that's the, what I call it, the talk across silos. Um, it is very much a process that CFOs will support as part of their budgeting and planning process if uh, they are appropriately educated on how pay bans and pay strategies actually help control costs and manage expectations or help the finance group plan and budget for next year's resources. Excellent. So I now think, Denise, you're going to take us into more of what I would call the guts or the, the concrete elements of, uh, you know, this type of compensation. So we're going to get into how you actually develop these. Right. So super simple, super tactical is uh, you know, the idea of managing employee expectations by letting them know what the pay level is for a job. And in some organizations, you may have production roles that have a single job rate. Everybody gets paid that rate, it's an hourly rate, and, and that's the deal. Uh, in other organizations, knowledge-based, professional and management, you tend to see a range, and I shouldn't suggest in some hourly environments you see a range as well, but, uh, but more commonly in, in salaried environments, there will be a range. There will be an entry rate, which would be somebody brand new coming into the role, uh, will be a while before they are fully productive in their role and have understood the organization and its requirements. Then there's the midpoint or the job rate, which should reflect someone who is fully performing all aspects of the job. And that should be the uh, point that is comparable with the fully competent market rate for the same job or a similar job. And then finally, the job maximum. This is the top of the band. And the band should be um, reflective of if there is someone who is contributing more than fully performing, more than the job rate, they're significantly exceeding or ready for promotion. You want to have a little bit of room to pay above the market um, and make sure you're retaining that person who may be ready for promotion or doesn't want a promotion but is contributing far more than the, what their base job requirements consist of. So what you're saying is back to the other slide when we talked about where you want to be in the 90th or the 25th percentile, either whichever one you choose, the end point you still want to be slightly higher than the end goal of wherever you are. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, so just a little example here of a typical pay structure. Uh, we've got seven bands here. Some organizations have 14, some have, you know, back in, you know, many years ago, I've seen as many as 32 band levels. And I will tell you, even in a large organization, 32 band levels, it's very difficult to differentiate between jobs to that extent. So uh, the trend, and, and many of you would be familiar with this, the trend a few, few uh, years back was to broadband these ranges and say, let's do these broader ranges that encompass that developing phase, encompass that fully performing phase, and encompass uh, this is the most we will be willing as an organization to pay for a role at this level. And then you'll see in the grayed out section on the right there that uh, uh, the market benchmark rate for a group of administrative jobs can be used to sort of, you know, uh, target that market rate against your midpoint and say, how far are we off? It will never be 100% matching unless you go back to the, the question earlier about individual pay, pay uh, pricing. But otherwise, we have a range that incorporates that market rate sufficiently for a group of administrative jobs. 
for those of you who have looked at market salary data, you will see that if you compare your three or four admin jobs with three or four admin jobs of different specialties in a salary survey, they tend to be fairly consistent around the job rate. So we look at a career progression model here where we move from an administrative or doer role, as I may refer to it, to a little bit more of a thinking role at a coordinator level, a specialist level where you're actually, you know, analyzing, problem solving, bringing a body of expertise to the table. Project management might be the next level where you're, you're coordinating uh, monitoring, assigning work. So you go up, uh, presumably, to the uh, leadership level and build your band to support uh, the compensation strategy that your organization decides to uh, deploy. You have building pay ranges. There's a lot of uh, more detail that, that we can get into, we won't do that today, but around uh, what is uh, regression analysis, how do we deploy that to make sure our ranges are working, that would be mostly applied in large organizations, but in a keep it simple model for small organizations, uh, a simple pay structure helps you to manage your employees' expectations. Once you have a pay structure in place, the next phase would be, or, or uh, component that we talked about uh, as part of our agenda, would be how do we administer our pay practices consistently and fairly. So these might include your annual performance review cycle where you incorporate performance into pay, uh, or it may be a step adjustment process where uh, many organizations that are unionized will have defined steps up to the job rate and the predetermined percentage adjustments uh, each year or uh, whatever the cycle may be. And uh, there will also be decisions around inflationary adjustments to your pay grid and whether you're going to uh, adjust that compensation grid each year to inflation um, and again part of your compensation uh, administration to decide who would decide the inflation amount to apply to a grid and at what point in time. The bonus or incentive compensation needs to be looked at, commission plans, stock option plans that you may have in place, uh, perks like car allowances or different uh, other forms of compensation. So all of that has to be factored in in terms of tracking and monitoring total compensation and changes within it. It is a pretty big pool of data to track and, uh, and definitely needs uh, a process, business process controls to stay on top of it. Promotional adjustments to recognize advancement. So uh, that might be, you know, somebody's moving from uh, admin to a coordinator level. Do they get a raise? If so, how much? It might be a move to a new role. Um, so if I'm moving from my admin to that coordinator role, what is my new band? How is my salary determined within that band? Or it might be that you've created an, uh, a new role in your organization that you never had before. How are you going to figure out what the band is for that job and how that hiring salary will be determined? Is it the recruiter that gets to select the new rate for that job? And or should there be uh, a job evaluation of that role to make sure it fits into your band structure? What happens when the band maximum is reached? So if someone's been there many, many years, they often hit the top of that pay band. And then there's a decision about whether they have hit the ceiling and won't get a further uh, increase until they fall within the band. We refer to that quite often as red circling. Or whether the bands are simply guidelines and people can move beyond their bands. So we need to make sure we're consistent in our approach. Otherwise, there's a perception that the pay practices aren't fair. There's another component of people that are brought in below band. And again, is everybody brought in at the minimum of the band regardless because that is the band attached to the job? Or would we have something called an underfill where maybe they don't have the right skills, experience, and qualifications, but are going to be assigned to the role with the assumption that they will come up to the minimum once they develop that skill set? There's another piece of it that is range position adjustments. So uh, when we're looking at uh, 
uh, where people are sitting in their band, what if somebody is exceeding the requirements of the job, but they're still back at the entry level of the band? Do we need to do an accelerated adjustment schedule for that individual to get them to the appropriate position in their pay range? Uh, sometimes you'll see a situation where people actually move to a job level below the level they're currently at. How do we handle that? Do they get a pay cut? Will they get grandfathered? What's the approach that the organization is going to take? And uh, what are the uh, appeal processes? If I don't believe as an employee that my job has been properly evaluated or that all the appropriate information has been considered when assigning my job to a range, what options do I have around requesting a job reevaluation? And who will that be done by? Will that be done by HR, by the manager, by a committee? Uh, certainly in terms of unbiased processes, uh, committee is viewed as the most unbiased approach to making decisions around job evaluation. And finally, uh, from an, admi uh, an administration point of view, reporting. So there are government agencies that need reporting, there are internal stakeholders that need reporting, the union wants to report, the, uh, there's certainly their dues are tied to um, in some cases, and uh, so many, many levels of reporting may just be a, a division leader that wants to know their division. So you've got to be able to slice and dice your compensation data in a lot of different directions. And uh, I hate to leave the best for last, but the pay communications, I think that is the most critical piece of the elements of your pay structure. It's really making sure that your pay communications are solid. The degree of transparency around bands is a question uh, that, uh, you know, any of you that are familiar with uh, some of the legislation that's come out requiring organizations when they post or advertise for a job to actually post bands. Many public sector organizations did that as a matter of course, but it's really just opening up the issue of transparency around our pay bands. And that's actually driving a lot of organizations to say, okay, we'd better have a good look at our bands and make sure we're prepared to uh, share them publicly. Um, you want to make sure that there's clarity around who owns the compensation related decisions. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this one. Uh, oh, HR decided how much you will get paid. Well, in fact, uh, you know, in many organizations, we need the managers to step up and own those compensated relate, compensation related choices and decisions. Uh, timing of uh, pay communications. And I, uh, comment before the pay check is issued. It's also, never cool to have somebody find out what their uh, raise is because they thought there was a payroll error and they've noticed a difference in their pay. We want to make sure that we've planned properly on a project management level to give managers time to have those communications with their employees, even uh, considering vacation schedules and what have you. Uh, we want consistent key messages. Speaking points are so important for managers around supporting the pay philosophies and the pay strategies of the organization. Really an education exercise. Um, total rewards, making sure that managers are comfortable speaking to the total compensation package uh, as well as just that base salary. And we find that uh, pay statements are a really healthy way to do that where individual employees get a summary of their entire compensation package. Um, again, linking pay to performance sometimes results in some tough conversations about pay with employees. So we want to coach our managers to have those conversations. We want our hiring rates uh, to be defensible and not upset our apple cart. So if you bring somebody in that is brand new and they're way above you know, all the existing employees that have been doing that role, that needs to be defensible. Um, otherwise, you create uh, turnover with some of those hiring rate decisions. Plateauing is a challenge for those red circled employees, the ones at the top of the band. Well, if their performance doesn't matter, how do you keep them engaged and interested in, in moving forward? And there are compensation strategies that help deal with that, things like re-earnable bonuses. And then finally, uh, pay freezes. In some cases, uh, and we've all seen it in the recession cycles, the organization decides to pay freeze or to freeze the grid and tap strategies to be able to communicate that that uh, decision has been made. So a lot of demands on the communication component of compensation.
Excellent. Thanks, Denise. So what we're going to do now, because these webcasts wouldn't happen, of course, if we didn't have sponsors. So we do have uh, Success Factors and HR Strategies who are sponsors of our webcast today. So what we wanted to do is take, actually, I'm going to take less than 15 minutes, probably 10 minutes, and go in and show you how technology can enable us to administer compensation much more effectively and eliminate the errors and the risk factors associated with how so many of us do that from an Excel perspective. And then Denise is gonna come back in and summarize up key points and initiatives and to help you get an idea of where you can start to be successful in these projects. So just bear with me while I get out of PowerPoint here and I get into the solution so that we can uh, see specifically um, how how the solution works. And I'm just gonna have to re-log in because I've been um, timed out here. So anybody has any questions? We did have uh, one question posed today. They can do that in the log at the top and we'll try to answer those um, during the session after this uh, little bit of um, demo. Otherwise, what we will do is uh, get back to you post demo. So right now I'm just logged into the Success Factor Solution Suite. I'm gonna go right into compensation and go into an annual review and just show you how we take all of those things that Denise uh, talked about today and put them in play from an overall uh, perspective inside the solution. So first and foremost, we have our budgets that we've agreed on. So we've tried to figure out where the mid, median, um, and maximum are in our organizations, where we want to be in those percentiles. And then in this scenario, we're actually Terry, doing a pay for, Terry, for yes. Just one second there, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, thank you, that's because I have it on the wrong dashboard. There you go. Here we go. Thank you. So this is uh, where we logged in and I've gone into the compensation and I've opened up our budget. So we're seeing here now um, specifically what budget I have as Jeff Hale is a manager who's responsible for these employees. I can go in and I can look at any of my individual employees and see how they've been trending here in the system uh, as far as data and information goes so that I can help myself uh, with making decisions around them. I can go next and we'll go from employee to employee in the system. We are bringing in an overall pay for performance scores here, including our merit guidelines. So these are some of the rules that are associated with it, depending on how I perform, how I get paid in the system. Um, for global organizations, it's important to be able to handle currency. You can see here, I can view it in local currency, my currency, or uh, the overall functional currency of the organization in the system. We can also look at guidelines based on dollar amounts or percentages, depending on how you like to work. You know, as Denise was talking about getting great survey data, we can bring that data and information in to help us understand how our employees are stacking up against market data. And then we can be able to capture and control all different types of payout scenarios that we have, and we have just a couple turned on here. So we could have state specific, so we know it's more expensive to live in New York and California than it uh, perhaps is in Ohio and Idaho. And we can have uh, state or country specific adjustments. We can allow for lump sum payments. And of course, we want to see our final salary um, basis and our compensation ratio. Then what also we can do here inside the system is have the ability to be able to um, create rules. So you can see our guideline here, and it can um, make logistics or rules around this. So let's just show you what happens. So if I go back into the system here and I try to give my employee a 9% increase instead of the 7% increase, these systems can stop uh, happening us from being able to go over our guidelines. So this tells me I've gone above my guideline. It's just giving me a warning. It tells me I have to put in a comment, but the system could actually stop anybody from being able to go over those guidelines. It also has the capability to do what we call what if scenario. 
So if I go over the merit guideline, I can mandatory make another approver required for that. So before it may have only been, um, you know, my manager and then the VP, well now the CFO has to get involved in making these types of decisions in the system because we did that. And as I allotted more money, you can see how that impacts my overall budgets here in the system. We can do stock op options and equity here in the system. It's asking me to make sure I want to navigate around here without making my changes. And if I go in, I can see where I can um, get into the equity component of it and I can actually do grants uh, in the system and maintain that information. And we can also bring in, just like we did mark data, stock performance information if we want to compare what's happening out on the marketplace. We also have a section for variable pay. Uh, again, could have been brought in your overall pay. We just find the tab gets too extensive. And this is the ability, we use this lots of time in those board of directors or executives where they get paid on things like EBITDA and, and such and performance of the business where we can see specifically how they're paid out. At any point in time, we can go and see what the approval process is for any of these payments, you know, what our instructions are. We can go in and look at uh, data and information and reports right here inside the system um, to help us understand better what we may or may not want to do. And then we can print out overall compensation statements. We can also do uh, spot bonuses and awards inside the system right here so we can go in and decide if it's a peer award or a best run award. Um, we can see what budget we have and then we can decide we may want to recognize somebody. We can choose who we want to recognize and we can go through this process that helps them decide their customer success or product breakthrough and then whether they're a rock star or a game changer. And then we can decide what the amount is that appears in these drop downs that they have to choose from to give those types of spot awards or bonuses in the solution. So that's a really quick overview of um, to be very, very complex in its capabilities around variable pay, but you can see where this would alleviate a lot of the heavy lifting that HR does and the worry around Excel spreadsheets being broken and uh, accounting and that not being accurate. So what we want to do now is go uh, back and uh, close up with Denise doing some summary remarks and giving you some to-dos to do. And I can say, Terry, as a practitioner for over many years, that uh, the ability to manage compensation on a system as opposed to by spreadsheet um, is probably a vision of most HR leaders. Uh, the challenge with spreadsheets, of course, is that people change them and formulas get mixed up. So really nice to be able to uh, to manage it in a way that is real time, where there's shared access. So uh, so that I'm sure for our uh, listening people would be a, a pretty attractive uh, scenario. So in terms of the compensation practices we talked about today, uh, just to summarize, the organization is highly competitive uh, with aggressive growth. Are you stable? Are you knowledge based? Are you high margin, low margin? All of those things uh, will help you design your strategy. And in terms of your compensation strategy, are you the best player versus uh, um, best total compensation package or total reward strategy? Do you want to grow your own talent or buy it? Uh, once you got your strategy figured out, you want to build your pay structure using the existing job groups and quality market benchmarks, or at least validate one if you've already got uh, a pay structure. And uh, you want to make sure your jobs are properly evaluated uh, in, in a systematic way and assigned to those pay bands without regard to uh, attributes that may be more to do with the individual in the job than they are the job requirements. 
You want to develop and update your policies for pay administration and make sure that there is consistency in those policies and that you have the ability to track and monitor the changes and keep them within the guidelines established. And finally, you want to provide a lot, a lot of support and communication for managers and employees. Excellent. Thanks, Denise. It's, uh, you know, listening today and, and chatting with you yesterday, you know, it makes me realize that so many people, when I talk to them around compensation, they think specifically, as I kind of just need to know whether I'm going to pay more than market at market or below market and then um, start to hire people in those bands. But they often forget about a lot of the stuff that you pointed out, you know, about what happens when people reach the, you know, the maximum band. You know, how, how is that communicated? You know, how do you handle those types of things? And not having those uh, plans and strategies in place, what the ripple effect to the organization can be from a negativity perspective. Because uh, we don't want to impact people that are at the top of their bands because they're often um, our longest term employers and perhaps and lots of times our, our best employees. And as you said, you don't want to always be doing exceptions because if you're doing exceptions it's viewed that you don't have a very solid policy in place so yeah. um the true test is the counter offer right when somebody comes in and tells you i've got an offer from another organization uh what is your organization's practice when that happens and so the idea of doing all of this work is to try and avoid that situation where you're being held over the barrel by the uh, employee because your pay practices aren't sound yeah, and, and being, you know, I think we've probably all been on that side of it is we all feel we should be paid what we're, what we deserve versus, you know, hey, now that I've got a better offer, you're going to match it. That's just not the way we should be operating yeah. in an organization. And that is not uh, how, you know, we want to treat our employees where they have to leave to get the money that they earn and they deserve. We want to make sure they're being paid fairly. because. Uh, the cost of retention, there's still a lot of um, ambiguity around the market about how you calculate that. Some people say it's, um, you know, the 30% of their salary. Some people say it's 100% of their salary. I think it's closer to 300% of their salary because, you know, it's the time they're out of that job and nobody's performing it in the loss. Um, you know, revenue associated with them contributing to whatever it is that you're selling, uh, you know, to your customers or providing to your customers. It's also the time and cost and effort of, you know, your team to replace them. Any cost you may be associated with, you know, headhunters or uh, uh, posting fees. And then the time it takes a new hire to get up to speed. Um, you know, anything we can do to greatly impact uh, retention is is critical here and I think this is a key component to starting starting that and probably the basis for career pathing which will probably be a topic that we talk about coming up so thank you Denise for sharing that with us and thank you everybody for uh, joining today if you have any questions or you want to reach Denise or myself our email addresses are listed here uh, HR strategies is a, a full suite consulting services with an HRIT practice delivering uh, success factors implementations uh, and and selling the success factors product suite be happy to talk to you about what we can do to enable you to be achieving greatness in HR regardless of where you are in your HR of HR technology thanks again and have a great day everybody